I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Today is the Platinum Jubilee in the United Kingdom, so we don't have a live show for you with all the latest updates from the battlefront. However, we've been collecting lots of your questions sent in on Twitter and via email, and I've put them to our panel of experts, Francis Sternley and Dom Nichols. What follows is their answers, and thank you again for sending your questions in. Do keep them coming. Well, thank you so much, Dom and Francis, for your time today in this special question and answer session of Ukraine The Latest, where we try and answer the questions you, the listeners, have put to our experts. Let's kick off. Kay asks, how much has Russia learned from early mistakes? Dom Nichols. Well, it's a tricky one. Uh, All we've got to go on is the evidence we see with our own eyes, because Russia have shown themselves not to be trusted for their for their words. And what I mean by that is that initially it was clear that they wanted to take over the entire country by cutting off the political leadership in the first 72 hours and then sort of presenting a fait accompli to the country. That didn't that didn't work and they were kicked out of the north of the country and then eventually we were told, no, no, the objective all along had been the Donbass. Well, I, I don't think that's true, but we're not sure as to whether or not they they learnt that they had to concentrate their force in the Donbass and come... Uh, come up with a sort of reduced level of ambition or whether it was forced upon them. But what we have seen is that after a faltering start where they eventually decided that having four wars, one in the north, this is on the ground, one in the north, one in the east, one in the south, and a war in the air was not going to work, they put General Dvornikov in charge and he consolidated the mission into the, the Donbass. Now, have they learned that? Did they learn that they needed to concentrate their forces and see the effect that the Ukrainian troops have been having on their logistic lines? Or or was it absolutely forced upon them? Or was this just blatant military logic? I mean, this is how you should do war, right? You shouldn't shouldn't try and attack Ukraine with three separate armies and an air force, nobody talking to each other. So I I don't know if they have learned. What they've gone back to is the traditional Soviet and Russian doctrine of pounding a place with artillery and then following it up with infantry and tanks that then plant a flag on the rubble afterwards and and declare victory and, you know, create a new line on the map. So I don't know if that is a, 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 a learnt lesson or if it's just what they do. And they, they can do that with the weight of firepower and a lack of care for their personnel. If they just push them forward into the meat grinder, then you you will achieve results if you have the greater numbers. Can I just add on a question to that? You mentioned artillery, tanks and infantry. What about the Air Force? I mean, yeah, what what about the Air Force? I mean, we've been somewhat flattered in the West in recently in that the the wars, although they've not gone well, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, that's that's a subject for another podcast series. But what it did show was that if you don't own the air, then you just have a much harder fight on the ground. So you have to gain air superiority or, lo- or air supremacy, which is you know, nothing moves in the air without your say-so. Air superiority, which is you, know, you can do what you like, and and um, local air superiority, which is you, you own chunks of the airspace for specific times or places, specific missions. So Russia should have, they, they attempted to, but failed. They should have knocked out the Ukrainian Air Force in the first... In the first few days, I mean, it, it took the 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 allies in in um, both Gulf Wars weeks to destroy the Iraqi air force on the ground and the air defence systems and anything else that might shoot back. So this is not done overnight. This is not done in twenty four hours, but it, it is an enduring effort, which Russia just did not do properly in the first place, or did not see through to the end when they realised that they they'd not got the right tactics in the first place. So they've. They are now operating. Their sortie rate, so the number of flights per day, is up again, up into the sort of low hundreds, which which sounds a lot, but that's one aircraft taking off, doing a mission and, and landing again, maybe not firing at anything, maybe just looking at something or maybe providing escort for other other aircraft doing stuff. But they are they are flying over their own territory, so Russian territory, and over the east of the country that's in Russian hands. They are not venturing forward. They are not going forward of their own troops uh, in order to create this this blanket underneath which the ground forces can manoeuvre. So the Air Force has, has not been doing its its job. It's not 
knocked out the Ukrainian force and it's not operating a blanket of air cover such that their their own troops can move safely underneath it. So no, you, you, good question. <laughs> what about the Air Force? Moving away from military questions, uh, we've got two good questions about NATO, both um, concerning the potential accession of Finland and Sweden. Um, Bo writes that analysts say that Erdogan's resistance to Finland and Sweden joining NATO is a bid for concessions from those countries. What's to prevent other members of NATO using their votes for similar purposes, such as Viktor Orban, who's blocking a Russian oil embargo? I guess that's interesting. Could you give us an insight into how NATO countries think about their membership and, and would they use them to, to win concessions like this? So NATO is a, def- is a defensive alliance. It is not yet a political alliance. It veers into politics. Of course it does. But it is not a political alliance. It's not an economic alliance. So the the... We've got to be careful what we're looking at here. Um, so, for example, Hungary, Viktor Orban, talking about oil embargoes and, and wanting to carve out for, for his country to get uh, oil supplies from Russia. I mean, that that is, as was debated this week, that is an EU matter rather than a NATO matter. Now, you know, there's overlap here, of course. You know, if, if you're if you're not a good if you're not a good partner in one of these one of these clubs, then it's not as if you can completely forget that when you go and have a meeting of the other club. But you know, NATO is a defensive alliance, military alliance, rather than an economic bloc. So something like oil embargoes would have little impact into the military side of the relationship between Hungary and, and everyone else. Turkey trying to get carve-outs for their vote to allow Finland and Sweden to join. Because remember, NATO at the moment is a 30-member 30, 30 alliance and every member has to say yes to any, any, new, any new countries joining. So every single country has a, has a veto. Turkey, it was sort of expected that Turkey was going to be a little bit grumbly. Um, uh, Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan, is, is known for looking for every opportunity. I mean, he's a politician, you know, that shouldn't surprise anybody. Looks for every opportunity to, to, get, to get, something, get something for his country, fair play. Um, so I think it was always thought that, that there would be a little bit a uh, little bit of, of rumbling over this, over the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, which which um, you know, Turkey says uh, is a terrorist group operating from its soil, attacking uh, attacking um, Turkish uh, Turkish interests and, and personnel infrastructure. Turkey says that that, that Sweden and Finland have, have been a bit um, less full throated in their in their condemnation of some of the acts from the PKK. So there is a there is a bit of history there. Um, I think. Turkey will come round. Turkey is a fascinating country. Okay, it, it's it's in Europe, it's in Asia, it's in NATO, but it, it has very strong ties to Russia. It controls the Bosphorus Strait, so the the uh, route in the access to the Black Sea. So it's in a very powerful position, and it's a huge country, huge huge economy. So a really a really notable country. It's one that that does have political heft and military heft, and and, and is not shy in sort of throwing it around. Um, I mean, for example, Turkey has carved out a, a land corridor in the north of Syria, about 30 kilometres deep, into which it wants to put back the uh, circa 1 million Syrian refugees that have come over the border since Daesh have been, have been um, operating in Syria. Now, by doing that, Russia have had to divert some resources into Syria, to, uh, and we've seen them flying into the airfield up in, up in the north part of Syria, just to, just to make sure... That that's not going to destabilize the, the the Syrian government. Now, is that is that Turkey just taking advantage of a of a lucky geopolitical situation, or is that Turkey doing a little bit there for the Ukraine war by diverting some Russian resource? We don't know. But Turkey is an interesting an interesting character, uh, interesting country, and and Erdogan in particular is a is a very interesting political leader, and will take every opportunity to to further his the, the advances of his own country. We've got another question from Tom about NATO, spun in a slightly different way. He says, What I've been asking myself for the past couple of weeks is why no one is talking about using Finland and Sweden's application to NATO as bargaining chips with Russia. Wouldn't it make sense to be offering Putin a deal to not accept the new applicants in return for peace in Ukraine? Now, in- initially, my thought on reading that question is, to go back to what Ben Wallace, the British Defence Secretary, said, that it's it's up to these countries, it's up to Sweden and Finland. It, it's th- th- we've got to respect their autonomy as well. That's my instinct. What would you say, Dom? Yeah, no, I think I think you're spot on there. It's um, I don't think NATO has the has a desire to go around trying to hoover up other countries, um, and certainly not to play grand politics by trying to make some 
great bargain with Russia of you know if you don't do this then we will allow these these countries to join. I just don't think that I don't think that's the reality um, because I don't think they've got the bandwidth to try and try and work that kind of thing out. You know, when people talk about conspiracies, I mean you know it, it's always cock up. It's not a conspiracy. If you ever tried to be part of a conspiracy, it's just exhausting. You can't do it. So I don't think NATO do that. And also, I, I think if there was ever a whiff that those kind of politics were being played, it would it would just be explosive within the bloc. Because, as I said, NATO, a 30-member group with Sweden and Finland, expected to join soon, 32 members. And on the, on the big decisions, it's one country, one vote. Now, of course, we all know that the US is the big, is the big chief here, the big military player. However, when it comes to matters of policy, it is one member, one vote. But if the smaller members of NATO thought, oh, am I really, am I not that, not that big a deal? Does my my voice not count for anything? Am I just here as some sort of bargaining chip for the big boys to play with? It would just undermine the whole ethos of of an alliance. So I just don't think those politics enter the way that, that NATO NATO operates. But secondly, those considerations have always been there. I mean, Putin was unwise to think that his actions would not change the security architecture of Europe. Now, maybe he judged that Sweden and Finland would not apply to join NATO, but it would be it would be surprising if they hadn't seen what was going on and decide for closer military ties in an already very deep military relationship between Sweden and Finland and, and NATO. Um, Sweden and Finland, for example, in JEF, the Joint Expeditionary Forces, 10-nation... Ten, ten um, grouping, Northern European grouping, the sort of beer drinking North North European club of of countries that turn up on day one, and so they've they've been in that now for for a couple of years and they exercise regularly with with all their you know, North European partners. So they're very very close ties already to NATO, and Putin was a bit unwise to think that that, that there weren't going to be closer ties. I mean, he, he said that one of the reasons for doing this this ridiculous adventure was to push NATO further away. And the point was made very clear to him that it was actually going to do the complete opposite, and that and that has been played out by these applications. So, so I, I think the the issue of Sweden and Finland joining was was always there as a as a as an issue to be considered, or it should have been considered a factor to be considered by by Putin. But I don't think that ac- actually playing politics to the to the extent of trying to do a deal and saying you know, by the by the bigger countries of of the of the of the club. That exists already, saying we will we will not allow them to join if you do this. I don't think that would have been happening. Thanks, Tom. We've got a question here for you, Francis. Um, how great is the current threat of the use of nuclear weapons? I think the threat of nuclear weapons has been diminished in recent days. And the reason that I say that is I was very interested in the remarks made by the Russian ambassador in an interview with the BBC over the weekend, where he basically said that that a tactical nuclear strike in Ukraine was was not on the table by Russia. Now, I know you could say, well, you know, um, why should we believe anything that the Russians have said? Their propaganda throughout the war has been built on lies and manipulation. But I think it should be read in the uh, broader diplomatic context of the overtures being made by Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz to uh, Russia, that essentially they want this war to end as soon as possible. And I think we should read these kind of climb downs by um, Russian officials as symbolic of a change in tone and a desire for this conflict to end as soon as possible. Of course, the motivations for that from Germany and France are well known. We've spoken about it many times on the podcast. They want the the energy crisis to be alleviated. They want the food crisis and the cost of living crisis to be alleviated. And they also want to de-escalate the military uh, threat that may be posed by by Russia long term. I think that's a rather naive view, as listeners will be aware. But anyway, that is, I think, the the diplomatic context and why I think the nuclear threat has, has been reduced. And of course, I don't think that threat would have necessarily been reduced, I should say, if... Uh, if, let's say, the West had not provided the military support that it has for Ukraine. I think actually part of this de-escalation is as a response to Russian failures, militarily, diplomatically, is that they realise that they are cornered here. The Russian economy is plummeting uh, by about 15%. And, and, and you know, that no, no nation can sustain that um, unchecked without admitting sort of certain 
requirements for concessions long term. So I think that absolutely the, the West was right and NATO was right to, to be as firm as possible on this. Just one other piece that's relevant to your question. Uh, we had a piece in the paper several weeks ago now by Dr. Jade McGlynn, who uh, argued you know, that we should take the Russian nuclear threat seriously. When one immerses oneself in the propaganda uh, in Russia, the, the threat posed by NATO and the West becomes existential from their perspective. Um, it, it is uh, it sort of plays into this Russian mentality, which we've talked about many times, of Russia sort of wanting to be fundamentally undermined, perhaps even destroyed by the West. And so the propaganda sort of reiterates that. And I would point listeners to a, a, an excellent piece, a really thought-provoking uh, piece online on The Economist, where they take an, an average re- um, Russian citizen... They, uh, through what they read, what they see, what they hear over an average day and and puts you in the shoes of that person. And you see just how you can imagine over weeks, months, years, arguably decades of this kind of propaganda can, can make one view the war in Ukraine in the way that many Russians do. So I don't think that the threat is, is completely diminished, but I think that as part of a response to Zelensky's uh, military successes and also as a part to concessions that are willing now to be made, unfortunately, I would argue, by by, by France, Germany and other European powers that the situation has changed and, and the likelihood has, 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 has been diminished. But that doesn't, of course, mean that if, if things really did become more and more severe from a Russian perspective, that Putin may not change his mind. Just staying with you, Francis, lots of our listeners are impressed by your, your grasp of history and your use of historical analogy to understand uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Well, that's kind. <laughs> um, what, what historical events uh, can people look to or read about that you think can throw more light uh, and provide more nuance to understanding uh, to today's conflict? Um, well, of course, appeasement has been one of the most topical. Um, and I don't think there's anything yeah, <laughs> particularly nuanced that I can offer in terms of, 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 of focusing on that period in the 1930s very, very closely. Um, it's been done to death, frankly, I think. But I, w- I do think it's highly relevant to this. Certain mistakes, I would argue, that were made in the 1920s and 1930s are being reiterated here. And of course, that's very worthy of close study. There's been a lot of other talk about the um, Finnish War of 1939 when the Soviets invaded Finland and the the Finns were able to beat them back against almost innumerable odds. I think that is a very helpful comparison in some ways, but unhelpful in others. The weather was a huge factor in the Soviet defeat there in a way that I don't think should be overestimated. So whilst some echoes are, are, are worth study, I think others mean that it can be slightly overused as it has been over discussed. The last piece of history that I've been very interested in in in, in, in recent days is the Congress of Vienna in 1814, 1815. Now, this might be um, an, an alien historical event for many listeners. So just to sort of reiterate what it was all about. Essentially, the Congress of, of, of Vienna was the attempt by the great powers of Europe to essentially rebuild Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. Um, Napoleon had been defeated. He actually came back during the Congress um, for for another attempt of, uh, uh, of, of subduing Europe, but was defeated at Waterloo um, very swiftly. I think it was June 18th, 1815. Um, I'm sure listeners will tell me if, I've, if, I, if I'm wrong. June, I've got a feeling it's June 5th. June 15th, but we can check. Oh, sorry. Don't, 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 anyway, sorry. I, 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 sh- I should know this. Every every uh, every Did British school boy should know this. I said the 18th, yeah, I think. You're correct. Oh, June, yeah. sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, David. Um, but uh, yes, so um, by the way, if anyone wants to go and visit the battlefield, it's, it's fascinating, a really interesting place to go and, 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 and um, well worth the visit. But anyway, many listeners, I'm sure, are wondering why the Congress of Vienna is is relevant to this. Essentially, as I say, it was an attempt to, to, to uh, rebuild Europe after the um, chaos and destruction of the Napoleonic era. The philosophy of that was essentially that great powers should be able to dictate to smaller powers their borders and on other matters, their leaders as well, um, in order for the uh, for the greater good. And uh, I think that that is shared, actually, by many uh, leaders in Europe today. I was very interested in the remarks by Henry Kissinger at Davos, where he essentially made this same point again. Now, he wrote his doctoral thesis at Harvard um, on the Congress of Vienna. So he's very much, uh, I think, a believer in its fundamental principles, that certain sovereignty should be willing to be sacrificed, certain concessions to be made to powers like Russia, for the greater good. And I think that's all well and good. And you could say, well, it, you know, the Congress of Vienna was, was broadly successful until 1914. It's often talked about as being sort 
of 99 years of peace. That's actually not quite true because you had the Crimean War and several other escalations. But even so, there was not a huge world war in the same way that the Napoleonic Wars had been after Vienna. But, and this is the fundamental point, I think it was for a different age. We are now in the modern era it's, it's, it's democratic and, and nations have a much greater sense of their own sovereignty and own nationality than, than, than arguably in the, in, in the 19th century. And people have, 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 I think, a right to say that we don't want to be uh, dictated to by uh, great powers. And indeed, in the 20th century, when that has occurred, it has arguably not been as successful. Look at Versailles, look at Potsdam. I don't think you can say there's been an unmitigated successes in terms of foreign policy. So um, I just mention it. And if people want to read more about the Congress of Vienna. Um, I wrote a piece for the paper over the weekend. I think it's called uh, Ukraine is set to be sacrificed on the altar of globalization. A rather gloomy title, but I, I sort of talk about this and and I and I just think it's worthy of worthy of study because too often, as I say, political leaders, I think perhaps most broadly echoed now by Emmanuel Macron in, in, in Europe, really do believe in this idea that the great powers have a right to to dictate borders and concessions made by smaller powers. And that may well have worked in the 19th century, but I'm not sure that it worked in the 20th. And I would say it certainly won't work in the 21st. Francis, just one tiny questionette for you, just on the historical analogies. You mentioned the uh, the Winter War, the, mm. the war between um, Finland and the Soviet Union. And of course, uh, we, we do remember the, the heroic Finnish resistance and, and the, the, how they inflicted huge losses on the advancing Russian armies, the Soviet armies. Russia did win that war. They forced Finland to concede nine percent of its territory, Karelia, which has never been returned to, mm. to Finland. Mm. So I, I just wonder if 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 the first half of the war is is useful and analogous and, and fruitful to understanding Ukraine, could the second half, which I know in the West we don't often talk about because mm. it's essentially heavy artillery bombing Helsinki until the Finns surrender, is mm. that also useful? Very much so. I think, and and actually, as we enter what I would say is now the second phase of the war. It's becoming increasingly relevant because what I, I think the war began as a black and white issue. You, you were either on the side of the Ukrainians or you were on the side of, of the Russians. Now, a grey area is emerging where, as I say, certain leaders in Europe, certain powers are willing to see certain concessions as the Finns were, were forced to concede in 1939. And so, yes, uh, we, we, we can learn lessons from both phases, I think. But broadly speaking, I think the lessons of history would, would say that Any concession to a power steered by an autocratic dictator usually does not end well. And even if that may have been the case in uh, in the Finnish in the situation of the Finnish war, just look at what came afterwards. And I'd say that echoes that point. And just a final question for you, Francis. I think it's fair to say you've talked a lot about politics, a lot about geopolitics, and a lot about the EU. We've had some some criticisms. I wouldn't say flags, just some some gentle <laughs> criticisms from from listeners um, who pick you up on some some of your points about the EU. So can can I can I ask you? You've talked a lot and very eloquently about the shortcomings of the EU and the Commission in regards to Ukraine. What do you think has been the most effective, or the best thing that they've done? I think any forum for dialogue is a good thing in a democratic world, and so of course Brussels, Strasbourg offer opportunities for that dialogue, the sort of relationships that prove vital for strengthening resistance, the sort of backroom deals that may well have provided crucial weaponry at crucial moments. Any forum like that can be can be beneficial. And I would say that um, if the European Union hadn't have been there, obviously we'd live in a different world, so one, one can't really imagine it. But if it hadn't have been there, then it would have that that would have been assumed by by NATO. But would it have been potentially as successful? Who knows? So I think that the fact that there are multiple avenues for dialogue is, of course, something that is a positive. I should say that my own critiques, criticisms of the European Union are, are not perhaps as existential as people might think. I think that there is, of course, a place for for a union of sorts within within Europe. But it's the, I think it, it's the issues around as any huge bureaucracy or any huge power faces throughout history. The big issue is 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 the time that things can take. And, and time is a luxury in war. And I do firmly believe that if, if, if this had been, let's say that the fate of, of Ukraine had rested entirely on the decisions made in Brussels from the outset of the war. Let's say they'd said, right, the war starts, we must now convene 
X, Y, and Z on so date, so and so date, and determine a unilateral defensive policy. By the time that will have been agreed between the various powers, with all of their various different perspectives, just look at how Hungary is far more closely aligned with with, with Putin. Say, if you'd waited, then I think that Kiev may have well have fallen, and I think that um, the speed of response would have been slower. And I know that certain listeners will be replying to that and saying, yes, but look, certain other European Union powers did act decisively. Look at the Czech Republic, look at the Poles. You know, they're still members of the European Union. But my point is, and this is this is the fundamental crux of what I'm saying, is that they were acting, I would argue, against the instincts and against the desires of the Commission. Because the Commission want a unilateral response that is agreed. They think that's that's the best way of, of, uh, of steering policy on the continent. And that is, as I say, a, a, a luxury. There's all this talk about a European army has been renewed, and I think that also plays into this. And I just would ask listeners to, to ponder that what may have happened if there had been that delay and, and a wait for, for said response, because ultimately I think it would have been proven too late and it took the proactive and speedy responses of, of Britain and America and, of course, certain other powers as well that, that were able to, to get weapons there sooner than would have been possible in an ideal world as conceived by the European Union. And I think it may well have saved Ukraine and saved Vladimir Zelensky, perhaps even his life. Well, thank you very much, Francis, uh, for your answers there. I just, um, just want to add before we go back to Dom that, of course, if you have more questions, if you want to follow up, please do get in touch. Thank you very much for listening, all of you. And even if you don't necessarily agree with everything uh, our experts are saying, that's completely fine. And do keep your questions coming in and keep your ideas coming in. Uh, We've got a question from Peter who asks, what do we know of the success of back-channel military communications between the US and Russia? Don Nichols. Well, I guess in the nature of back-channel communications, we we don't know anything, which means either they're working fantastically or they're they're just simply not there. Now, we do know uh, was it two or three weeks ago? Uh, Lloyd Austin, the US Defence Secretary, said that he had, for the first time in the, uh, the conduct of the war, had a phone conversation with his opposite number, General Sergei Shoigu, the, the Russian Minister of Defence. The nature of that conversation, we, we don't know. It seems not to have led to anything, any great changes on the ground. Um, the current debate about should America be supplying high Mars, the high mobility artillery rocket system. Uh, the, the, the diplomacy for that, for that was played out in, in plain sight anyway, so I don't think that was the subject of any background negotiation. So, so I, don't, I don't think anything has come of those of that conversation. It's always good to talk. You've, you've got to have a way of talking to the opposition, even just to acknowledge the other's existence. If you don't have that, then then you, you, there is only really a military solution. This was, you know, we could talk about the fight against Daesh and ISIS and what have you. That's essentially what happened there. If you've got no way of talking to the opposition and finding some common ground on any level, then you're in a really, a really difficult spot. So it's good that, that Lloyd Austin spoke to, to Shoigu, even if, even if nothing happened. I mean, coincidentally, there, there is a phone line in the British MOD that, that goes through to the Russian Ministry of Defence. And that, is, that phone line is checked every day. And I'm told it's it's quite a frosty, quite a short conversation these days. It's literally just sort of, hello, the phone line works. Yes, it works. I can phone, you know, phone down. But it just proves the link is there so that if the leaders need to, in a moment of intense crisis, speak to each other, they can. So even in these times of, of very strained relationships, there's always there's still that acceptance on both sides that, hey, guys, you know, we've got to be able to find a way to touch the other side. Um, if we if we have to now whether or not there are back channel negotiations i i don't know i don't think so beyond the day-to-day diplomacy um through the um, embassy and diplomatic staff i don't know what would come of it at the moment i mean th- these these sort of back channels are used more frequently when negotiation peace negotiations are are picked up so they may well be there i would imagine at the moment the diplomatic staff certainly the intelligence agencies of, of the west are are just keeping in touch with their opposite numbers so that come the day of serious discussions about negotiations or whatever comes next then those lines are are live uh, already there they exist they've been tested and they they can then be used final question for dom this is from a different mark i believe he says what does the actual fighting in the donbass look like when we say artillery fight or duel how does that combine with the infantry or armor I have visions of those World War One diagrams of arches of incoming artillery followed by neat rows of advancing troops charging trenches. But what does an advance by the Russians actually look like? Well, the reports we're getting, certainly from the Russian side, it seems that it, that it is actually quite 
First World War, a, a barrage of artillery, and, the, and then lines of advancing troops, and that's why they they are losing so many troops and and vehicles. Now, a, a smart use of artillery, when it's combined with infantry and armour, and all the other uh, capabilities in the military force, they would not just to just just smash the place up and roll in afterwards uh, is is one is one way of doing it. But I mean, if if you're seeking to gain ground and and hold it and then and then use that ground, it's not that's not a that's not a terrific way of. Um, you know, it's back to the kind of the, the Vietnam quote. What was it? We had to destroy the village in order to save it. I mean, it's just it's just ludicrous. But what what it what we see from the Ukrainian side is they're trying to use artillery first of all to destroy the Russian artillery, this, these long range fires, but also to use it. It, when combined with the other other arms that are operating on the on the battlefield, the point about artillery is that it, that it can produce what's called shock action. So a sudden arrival of a huge amount of high explosive across a very large area not only catches troops and 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 personnel in the open, so not you know, not covered. So you're you're likely to get a load of um, all the not all but the vast majority of casualties in the first ten seconds of any barrage because after that people have got under cover. But also the the psychological impact of that. I mean, it's just. It's just colossal. I've only ever been under artillery fire once, and that was by my own side, delightfully. British or American? British. Um, but, I mean, it's only in training. So at Sandhurst, trained to be a British Army officer, you, you go through all the, the artillery package, and then you go to um, you go to Bombard OP, Bombard Observation Post on Salisbury Plain, where you're bussed in to this, this big underground bunker with, with these windows with, like, massively four-inch thick glass window type thing. And um, then the bus is trundle off and everyone confirms that everyone's outside the range danger area and then they shell you and you're looking out wow. the window watching <laughs> shell shells burst literally just the other side of the uh, of the glass to give you a give you a feel for what it's like to physically feel the ground moving and hear it and this this sudden i say this one moment you're you're nervously chatting to your mate wondering when it's going to start and then the, the next bit is just this it's just this deafening onslaught of noise dust mist earth and that's and that's when we are you know, you'd like to think completely safe in, inside the OP. So to have that actually occur to you uh, in real life is not only devastating in terms of the the people it can kill and the equipment it knocks out, but just the psychological impact. That's where the phrase shell shock came from. You know, it's just the, the psychological impact is immense. Uh, and that's one thing that, that Russia have always invested in. Stalin said artillery was the god of war and, um, and they, they still believe it. I guess one interesting thing to add to that is that the soldiers of both sides won't have experienced anything like that. I mean, the Russians in Syria wouldn't have had a lot of people shooting back with this sort of intensity at them that the Ukrainians are. And similarly, the Ukrainian army won't have experienced this because 2014 was, wasn't quite like that. Is, is that fair? Yes, it is. I mean, they uh, and the Western armies would have had mortars coming back at them and rocket propelled grenades uh, and what have you. And, th- and they, are, they are very shocking. You know, I've experienced spent those in in Iraq and yeah I mean it doesn't have to be a very big bang to be quite near you to to to, 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 to shake you, you know, to paralyze you for a few seconds before you realize what's going on and oh my god they are, you know this is actually happening and, and, and what have you so um yeah it, it is unusual to have this weight of fire because we haven't had a war like this in Europe since the second world war but they would have had some exposure to it along the along the line of control through the um, through the eastern donbass since the russian invasion of 2014 Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gere. 